I would like to begin by acknowledging that we're gathered here today on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. My name is Ainsley Rouse, and I'm the Senior Manager, Academic Integrity in the Office of the Provost and Vice President Academic. In recent years, there has been an increased focus on academic integrity here at UBC, but UBC is not alone. Many institutions have increased their support in this space, both during the pandemic created to uh, related to increasing visibility of misconduct cases or academic integrity issues. But at UBC, academic integrity work predates the pandemic and the move towards an educative approach or changing the conversation around academic integrity emerged largely from the TLEF project Cheating Hearts. From there and through the pandemic, UBC has carved a strong place and voice in the academic landscape on this topic. Central support for academic integrity has come in many forms. The launch of an academic integrity hub in the provost's office, which I'll tell you a little bit about later on. The creation of a new website aimed at students and faculty. The continued development of new educative resources, such as the Take Five campaign, new videos or new modules and finally direct support around the implementation of the diversionary process recently introduced into the academic misconduct regulation. An important aspect of this investment in academic integrity is the desire to support and build a culture of academic integrity on the one hand, but more specifically to strengthen and support an educative approach. So what exactly does that mean? From my staff perspective, situated in the provost's office, supporting an educative approach means expanding support for faculty and for students around academic integrity and academic misconduct. It means engaging in initiatives that make academic integrity an institutional priority, that elevate the value, and that explore and expand connections between academic integrity and UBC strategic commitments. What we have done so far in the provost's office is to create an academic integrity hub. This is a focused team working on academic integrity and academic misconduct structured around three key pillars, institutional awareness and commitment, academic integrity education, and academic misconduct support. Concretely, some of the things, some of the ways we are doing this, an AI awareness week for faculty and students, putting materials online to facilitate teaching and learning around academic integrity, creating new materials to increase transparency around the academic misconduct process, and also making sure that UBC can respond to academic integrity matters in a timely way that make academic integrity the living and breathing topic that it is, especially in the face of new technologies. But back to my earlier question, what exactly is an educative approach to academic integrity? That in large part is what this panel is intended to discuss today. We've assembled a, a wonderful panel from across the university, panelists who represent various roles involved in this topic, including the ombudsperson, instructors, associate head, associate dean, undergraduate and graduate student roles. What we hope to unpack here is exactly how these various roles do and can participate in supporting an educative approach to academic integrity. But we also want to look towards the future to what UBC can aspire to and continue to explore. So thank you to the panelists for their contribution today. Thank you to the audience for attending, for your time and your interest. The goal of this panel is to check in on what we're doing, but it's also to talk about what we can do. So with that, I'm happy to introduce our first panelist, Shirley Nakata. Shirley is the Ombudsperson for Students, providing resources on both campuses to support students through fairness challenges they face with the university. The office also works to advance systemic improvements to ensure fairness in rules, processes, and decision making. Welcome, Shirley. Thank you so much, Ainsley. I'm really happy to be here and um, really looking forward to the conversation. So um, I guess the question that's posed and um, I think it has meaning for us in all different ways from our roles, but for me and uh, from the Ombuds perspective, I think it really means about, um, it means connecting at the very highest level, um, our academic mission too, but also embedding it with what UBC has articulated as its core values and strategic commitments. And as academic integrity has to be centered in that mission, um, I think we have to uh, make academic integrity 
um, inextricably connected to and shaped by, and also held accountable to UBC's promises and values and all the commitments and statements and strategic plans that we've set out, including the Inclusion Action Plan, the um, Indigenous Strategic Plan, the Student Strategic Plan, Wellbeing Plan. There's so many commitments we've made. And so I think these plans and statements frame how UBC yeah, so, um, does, how we hold ourselves do both individually integrity. and institutionally accountable to the mission and goals of this university. And when I say accountability, I'm talking about all of us, how we as staff, faculty and students understand, interact and implement UBC's promises into academic integrity. And for me, um, if I speak about this more concretely, um, it includes shifting the burden to no academic integrity from the student and more to the university. And that requires awareness and attention to the fact that we don't all arrive here on the same or the level playing field that we think we do, um, especially um, in terms of having the same understanding and assumptions with respect to academic integrity. I think it also means ensuring that we support our decision makers, and that includes everyone from instructors and TAs, administrators, deans, lab managers, uh, grad advisors, um, to ensure that we help them have or build their capacities and competencies in a range of areas that can foster academic integrity that aligns with UBC's strategic commitments. So at a bare minimum, that includes our human rights obligations, our understanding of trauma and trauma-informed approaches, cultural competencies and sensitivity, and from the ombuds perspective, um, basic understanding of what fairness requires us to do in a way that is embedded with U UBC's strategic commitments. So I think I'm at my three minutes. Thanks, thanks so much. Thank you very much, Shirley. We're going to move on to our second panelist, uh, Lori McNeil. Dr. Lori McNeil is a professor of teaching and associate head undergraduate in the Department of English, Language and Literatures. Since 2015, she has been leading initiatives at UBC related to rethinking academic integrity policy, procedure, and pedagogy, including as principal investigator of a large teaching and learning project in first year writing courses. She's a member of the President's Advisory Committee on Student Discipline. And in 2022, her contributions were recognized with a Tricia Bertram Gallant Award for Outstanding Service from the International Center for Academic Integrity. Lori, welcome. Thanks, Ainsley. And uh, thanks also to, to Shirley for, um, I think we'll have some lots of synergies. I think you'll, you'll hear lots of synergies over this panel. For me, an educative approach, and I'm, I'm wearing my multiple hats here as educator and administrator, is one that recognizes academic integrity uh, as both a principle and a set of skills that students don't inherently know about, value, or understand how to apply. Since it's foundational to our practices as scholars, we think, um, is something that we can and we should be teaching so that students can meet this expectation. That means we can meet them where they are, we can engage them as partners uh, to take up academic integrity throughout their degrees. An educative approach, as I've just outlined, really marks a shift in perspective from traditional ways that institutions have thought about responses to academic misconduct. Traditionally, they've taken a punitive or disciplinary approach, and that's one that puts the entire onus on students. For example, at UBC, until our most recent calendar updates, um, our calendar noted that whether or not students intended to commit misconduct, they were responsible for doing it if they had done it. Um, as academic integrity scholar Tricia Bertram Gallant notes, that framework, quote, lets the institution off the hook uh, because it says nothing about our responsibility as educators or as a university, that accountability that Shirley was discussing. So as an educator and an administrator, to me, an educative approach involves that responsibility, my responsibility to create the conditions in which all students can do their work with integrity and so that they can understand why they should. I know Jackie will talk next about some more specific ways she does that in her classroom. So I'll use my time here to say just a few things about what I see as the fundamentals to teaching with integrity. 
One of the responsibilities uh, that I see educators needing to uphold is to understand what academic integrity is and what misconduct is. Like students, it's not actually a given that all faculty and staff um, know what the expectations are or what counts as violations of, of integrity expectations. The institution has a role to play in creating and sharing uh, very clear definitions, and that's work that Ainsley and her team has been leading. So now at UBC, we actually do have that material. <clears throat> now it's up to administrators and to faculty to do their own work to get informed and to understand so that they know um, what these expectations are and can communicate those to their students. Teaching with integrity also involves bringing our best scholarly ways of knowing to this issue, proceeding from evidence rather than from assumption or stereotype. Um, and that's often where conversations about academic misconduct um, begin and end too often. Faculty and administrators need to do some learning, often unlearning about the unconscious or perhaps very conscious bias they may be bringing to their expectations about who commits misconduct because uh, without that unlearning, we're participating in the reproduction of exclusion and harm by relying on assumptions. And this is where Shirley's call for us to take what I would call an EDI-informed approach is really key. At the same time, we need to find out more about why students commit misconduct, think about the ways instructors and departments could remove some of the barriers for students, and provide more support. To me, that whole learner approach is also part of the responsibilities of an educative approach. Two more points. In our course design, we need to think about, sometimes rethink, how we're asking students to demonstrate their learning so that we're rewarding integrity. This might mean some fundamental rethinking, but more often it means asking our questions in new ways. Um, if you have been online at all in the last few days, you'll know that um, we're currently in a big moral panic about chat GDP, AI soft uh, produced academic, so AI here meaning artificial intelligence, that's going to write all of our essays. I actually really see that as an opportunity for us to be rethinking our approaches. Finally, a key part of our educative approach is to make sure that we know and can carry out our responsibilities when we do find a case of misconduct. I know those always are come at the worst possible time in our lives and they're time consuming and kind of a pain, but students need to know that we're keeping up our end too. Thank you, Lori. Our third panelist is Jackie Stewart. She's a professor of teaching in the Department of Chemistry and the Associate Dean Academic in the Faculty of Science. She special, specializes in teaching general chemistry, organic chemistry and science communication. Previously, she was the chair of the Academic Integrity Working Group at UBC Vancouver, which initiated the new dual campus academic integrity website that brought together resources on academic integrity and academic misconduct to support faculty, students, and staff. Welcome, Jackie. Thanks, Ainsley, and thanks everybody for being here. I'm excited to talk with you a little bit today about kind of that piece where um, we're thinking about an educative approach um, and our role as an instructor and uh, before any kind of suspicion of academic misconduct has occurred. So that's really the piece of educative approach that I wanna focus on. And uh, as an instructor, um, which is how I'm speaking today, I really view academic integrity through the lens of an inclusive teaching philosophy. And the goal here is to promote equitable course outcomes and open doors for as many students as possible. And since I'm from science, um, I'm really thinking about promoting integrity in a wide range of, of assessments and learning um, outcomes. So papers, projects, tests, quizzes, lab assignments, they're all in there. Um, and when I think about the connection between inclusive teaching and supporting academic integrity, I, it's really all about making expectations clear, offering support and guidance for what to do when students feel like maybe cheating is the only way through a particular situation, and trying to build course designs that support learning, and if possible, minimize worry and stress about grades, um, because that doesn't actually lead to learning and it can um, you know, be problematic. So when I think of inclusive teaching, some of the underpinnings are about recognizing that our students come to our classes with different life and educational experiences. And this is true even if they all meet the prerequisite requirements. 
Um, second, I want to make sure that a success in my course doesn't depend on how uh, well students know to navigate university systems and policies, um, nor the amount of social capital they have in terms of having a wide social network or not. And then third, really thinking about my role as an instructor in fostering a sense of community and a sense of belonging for all students. And I think all three of these things relate to academic integrity in some way. So thinking back to different life and academic experiences, um, many students haven't been taught explicitly about what academic integrity uh, means and probably not in my discipline. Um, and this is something I learned from Lori that it's really important to make it specific, make it really discipline based and explicitly teach academic integrity. And that helps really level um, the knowledge in the class. Um, also why it's important, right? And why they should care about that. Um, and this does hopefully address some of the situations where a breaches of academic integrity might occur because the expectations weren't clear. So I need to do that. That's my job as an instructor. Um, and I hope that we can build this in several times in a course. It's not just a one and done um, and really think of it like a course learning outcome. What is the academic integrity outcome that I want to focus on with my students? Um, uh, additionally, I think instructors can really exert their sort of positive influence on a class by talking about things like the predatory nature of contract cheating companies and present ways to get help in their courses that um, are going to be really high quality sources of help. That can also help students navigate university um, if they're a little bit less able to do that on their own. And then finally, thinking about sense of belonging and community in a course. Uh, as an instructor, I'm really the architect, I think, of that classroom climate. Really want to focus on a learning orientation, so trying to shift away the focus from performance and grades. So maybe I have course policies where it's okay if students make a mistake on an assignment because there's, you know, a way to um, drop the lowest quiz, for example, or rewrites on major assignments, or maybe not rewrites, but revisions built into the course design so that the emphasis is always on learning and improving. Um, I think that can be really helpful as well. And thinking about how we are bringing students into our disciplinary community through academic integrity instruction can help make that connection. So students are seeing themselves um, as belonging to a member of that community. So that's a goal I have. So um, to wrap up, thinking about um, you know, the increasing pressures that many students face, we know more and more students are working and they have additional responsibilities, um, which is great. We want um, a diverse student population. Um, we can uh, open the door to um, have students know that we're on their side, we're part of the same team. So I was inspired to kind of put a statement that was very explicit in my syllabus. I'm gonna read it and then I'll wrap up. Um, it just, it, as part of the academic integrity statement says, sometimes students who are experiencing a lot of stress feel the only way to deal with the situation is to cheat. Please do not do this. Talk to me and I'm sure we can work out something together. And so I've really opened that door and I feel like I put myself out there a little bit, but hopefully that does spark some conversations and have students think a little bit about how they can keep learning with integrity. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Ainsley. Thank you very much, Jackie. Um, we're staying within the Faculty of Science to welcome our next panelist, uh, Dr. James Charbonneau. James is the Associate Dean Students in the Faculty of Science and Associate Professor of Teaching in the Department of Physics and Astronomy. Welcome, James. Hello, everyone. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so I guess I'd like to talk about, uh, I guess, the, the Dean's Office role in uh, you know, an educative approach approach to academic integrity. Um, I think it's a it's an important point in the process because this is where if a student has some alleged misconduct, you know, there's been an investigation maybe at the departmental level that's been handled in a certain way, and it will come up to the dean's office for uh, us to look at. And I think a really important aspect of this, this meeting is framing it in terms of the fact that we, you know, we're at a university and this is a learning experience. Um, and that, you know, the, the student isn't, isn't a criminal, <laughs> you know, they might have made a mis like a misstep. Um, they might have made a decision based on uh, the circumstances that's happening to them, they might have had a misunderstanding. And really a lot of the goal of the, the meeting with the dean's office is trying to understand those. So if there's, if it's still sort of open, like if there has been alleged misconduct and the student's like, no, I don't think I, I did anything, 
There's still a, a, an investigation. So there's an investigatory, investigatory element to this where, you know, really trying to figure out what happened, what are the circumstances that led up to this? Um, and then there's a decision to be made at, at this point of does, does this get uh, a warning letter? Or do we find there's no misconduct? Do we determine that, oh, this is just uh, 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 no misconduct? Or do we go through the, the diversionary process? Or do we maybe go to the, the president's advisory council on student discipline? So there's a point to make that. Uh, another aspect of this meeting is um, it's often a meeting where students, if they have committed misconduct, uh, it's often when they first admit to it. Um, and this has been something that is often weighing on students for a while. So they admit to it in this meeting where maybe in the early meetings they were worried about the you know, the consequences are getting in trouble or they didn't understand really what was happening. Um, and so this is a place to really find out, you know, what was going on in the student's life, uh, you know, what things led up to the misconduct. You know, one thing that was mentioned earlier is there are these, uh, these uh, co contract sort of cheating companies that are incredibly predatory. Um, they do sort of look for students when they're at their lowest and at their most vulnerable. And it's trying to understand those kind of situations and trying to understand what a student is going through and really connect them with resources, connect them with counseling resources, connect them with advising resources, um, uh, you know, coaching, like academic coaching, peer coaching. Uh, these are all things that you can try to connect somebody with to, to help them. Uh, and, you know, one of our, our real goals is that we want the students to go and we want them to graduate and we want them to be successful people when they go out into the world and navigating these instances where you might have made a misstep um, and what are the situations that brought you to that misstep and understanding those so that when you get to that point in the future, you have a set of tools to uh, to navigate that is really important. and And I see that there's a there's a big part of uh, this first meeting with that. So I'll hand it off to uh, Stefania, I think, to talk more about the Dean's office. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, James. Um, Stefania will present another Dean's office perspective. She's the Associate Dean Academic in the Faculty of Arts and an Associate Professor of Teaching in Asian Studies. Welcome, Stefania. Uh, good morning, everyone. I have to say I'm just sitting back here really happy. Um, I, yeah, I've been probably doing this work, well, I don't know, but I was on PACSD a decade ago where um, there were patterns that uh, were a bit problematic and I started working with Shirley and, you know, this is work and changing the conversation thanks to Lori's uh, TLEF and uh, frankly, the advocacy that led to the development of the office that Ainsley is running. This is a decade if not more in the making. And so I feel um, happy <laughs> uh, in a topic that doesn't often bring joy when you're in the deeds office and having to spend many hours in PACSD hearings. Um, there are, so much has already been said. There are a couple points that I think I would like to bring up um, as far as the panel goes, just for because of how long I've been doing it. I've probably met with more students um, who it has escalated to the dean's office, certainly than James, because he's still a newbie. Um, and, you know, Shirley has probably seen many as well. But there are a couple things that I think I'd like to bring up um, that reinforce things that have already been said. So first of all, on the student side, um, there's a website uh, or an association, International Center for Academic Integrity, academicintegrity.org. Um, there's a Canadian branch now, but they've been running um, research and surveys uh, for almost 20 years, it looks like. Uh, the McCabe survey, where it found that more than 60% of university students freely admit to cheating in some form. So I think this is human nature. You know, you have a busy life and you try and find um, a shortcut. We're not catching everyone that cheats, right? And so for the ones that I have found that escalate, these are students, and it's a word that I think the student advocates may bring up, um, is student wellness. 
right? It's been brought up a little bit, but usually the students who get caught in a misstep are not thriving, right? They are handling so many different things in their lives and they perhaps are coming from some of these places where a different background, a lot of family pressure, uh, feeling that they're uncertain about why they're here or their study program. And it usually is coming from a, a, a moment of bad judgment, right? And so linking, I think for us, it's really important to think about, we tend to put wellness over here and academic integrity over here. And for me, one thing I've noticed is really that I'm often talking about the student's wellness because as James noted, um, we don't see this process, I think, as one that should be punitive or stop a student's ability to finish their degree. In fact, it, it's a moment to reflect and reevaluate. Um, so I think that it's really important as we try and change the conversation more, uh, both with students, is to acknowledge that trying to find a shortcut um, in a world of crowdsourcing and you know meal prep, um, that we're just lives are overburdened, and sometimes you need to find a shortcut. And sometimes you don't pick the best options. You don't order out the healthiest food. Um, you know that it's part of this being overwhelmed. So I think the wellness piece is really important. I think we need to question the biases of the of the of faculty, right? The students who struggle are those who often are coming in with. Um, less knowledge about our institution. My daughter, the child of two professors, um, you know, is going to know a lot more about academic integrity and the expectations than a first generation student or a student coming from a different culture. So I think it is really important that we check those. On the side of faculty, I think in, um, you know, from Shirley's perspective and Lori and Jackie and everyone, there's a lot of work we need to do with our faculty. Um, to be accountable, to acknowledge their role. Um, I think the disciplinarity is really important. You know, if they're getting it in a writing course, that doesn't really help them when they're coding computer stuff, which I don't really understand. Um, or foreign languages, the area that I work. The use of translation software is different than perhaps in an English course. Um, and also for faculty to own their own responsibility in the way they design their course. And not, I will say one other thing that I think has changed, but coming from a place of personal attack. You know, when I started in this role, faculty started from, how could they do this to me? You know, or do they think I'm an idiot that I wouldn't catch this? And it was about them. And I'm like, this is so not about you. You are in the position of power and privilege. And here is a young person who's been overwhelmed. Um, so I've had to intervene a lot just on how to help them have that initial communication with a student and to take it away from a personal affront to this is as much a learning moment as the presentation they're giving or whatever else it is. So I think there's still a lot of work that needs to be done in professional development for our faculty and students, but I do wanna end on a positive note that I have seen um, a real incredible change of the conversation. So the conversation's ongoing, but compared to a decade ago, I think we're in a much better place. Thanks all. Thank you, Stefania. Next, we'd like to welcome as a panelist, Dana Turdy. Dana is the Vice President, Academic and, um, Vice President Academic and University Affairs at the Alma Mater Society, the Student Union at UBC Vancouver, representing around more than 58,000 students. In this role, she collaborates with and advocates to the university on issues affecting students. Dana is also a UBC Vancouver student senator. Welcome, Dana. Hi, everyone. There have been very brilliant points made already, so I will try to keep this concise. Uh, so I'm a fourth year student studying political science and sociology. And like Ainsley has said already, I work at the AMS to support student experiences at the university. And so I think the university is already going in a really good direction with this educative approach um, instead of like we've kind of talked about shaming students and really placing the burden uh, wholly on them. Um, I think the key actually in a decentralized institution like UBC. Um, and so maybe this has a role in student orientations every year. Uh, maybe this is integrated within um, every program. Um, a student has to take a credit course um, or a module on academic integrity. I'm not sure, but I think the key is ensuring that, you know, 
this is consistent. Um, I think it's also important to note that students don't go into classes with the intentions to cheat or commit academic misconduct. And it doesn't happen in a vacuum. And rather what happens and what data shows is that they do so out of desperation, like we've already talked about, because of you know per personal circumstances, falling behind and feeling pressured to perform well past the class because of familial pressure. Um, and there's a lot of research on the growing mental health issues that students and young people are facing right now, especially with the affordability crisis. And this can be exacerbated by competitive and rigid academic contexts and courses. Um, and so there's also perhaps like a misunderstanding of what's permitted or prohibited in classes, which is where education plays a big role. And this has already been talked about a lot. Um, but for me, I think that professors have a lot of power with what they can do in their courses. Um, for example, um, along with addressing this in the syllabus, professors should strive to address these issues in class and have discussions about it where students feel empowered to participate um, and that it's a two-way street. Um, along with that, I think that it's important that we develop a shared definition of academic integrity. This is so important, especially with the rise of contract cheating and AI technology, and this could have great implications for the future of uh, academic institutions and academic integrity. And I think that UBC needs to think about these things now and be proactive instead of reactive. Um, and along with the kind of responsibilities and the power that instructors have in their courses. Um, students may cheat because there's a lot of at, lot at stake for them uh, for a particular assessment. For example, if a final exam or final essay is worth a substantial portion of their grade, which we see a lot, 60%, 70%, whatever, um, this can put a lot of pressure on the students. And so surveys have shown that students prefer final projects and in-class discussions to demonstrate their learning. And I know this can't be, you know, consistently applied across faculties or programs. Um, but for example, to quote one article discussing this matter, uh, giving several low stake quizzes throughout the semester as opposed to one final exam gives students more a sense of control over what they're learning and reduces their perceived need to cheat. As well, research shows that improvements in pedagogy and emphasis on mastery by instructors rather than performance goals, which I think uh, Jackie touched on as well, can actually help reduce cheating as well. Um, and so students see more value in what they are learning in their courses rather than focusing on grades or, you know, maybe um, kind of the... Um, how much money they will uh, be making after they complete their bachelor's, um, then this can also help reduce um, the perceived need to cheat. Um, and so just quickly on institutional responsibility as well, I think that we've seen with the rise of academic misconduct cases during COVID, um, there are a really lengthy wait time for students uh, for their cases to be heard regarding academic misconduct. And this can have implications for procedural fairness. Um, and students should know what resources are available to them, um, as this can be a really alienating experience. And so that's why I'm very grateful for um, our advocacy service at the AMS, which provides the support for students. Um, our advocacy coordinators, Kevin and Peter, and also Sahan at the GSS, um, who do this work on the ground. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Dana. Uh, and Perfect transition to Sahan. Um, our final panelist, Sahan Ghaffari, is one of the advocacy coordinators at the Graduate Student Society, the GSS. His role involves advocating for the rights and needs of over 10,000 graduate students at UBC in order to improve their graduate life experience. He is a PhD candidate in experimental medicine at UBC. Welcome, Sahan. Thank you very much, uh, Ainsley, and thanks uh, to the panel for providing me with this opportunity. So I guess to answer the uh, question, what uh, educative approach means to me, I would say it's a uh, collaborative effort uh, that involves both the uh, student uh, instructors as well as the institution uh, in order to ensure that learning in academia is achieved with integrity. And uh, to, to achieve this basically from a student perspective, uh, the students need to uh, have access to uh, a range of resources that would allow them uh, to know what exactly they are supposed to do, their responsibilities, and uh, obviously the consequences. And basically what we do as part of GSS at uh, Graduate Student Society, when we have cases 
that are related to academic integrity or academic misconduct, uh, we first try to analyze the circumstances, you know, the uh, situation, then depending on the case, we uh, try to put students in touch with other offices uh, at university, uh, such as the Ombuds office, if we feel that there is uh, issue uh, th that they can help with, or uh, with G plus PS, if there is possibility that uh, there's also supervisory issues and conflict involved. Uh, but uh, basically, when I look at this, uh, right now, what we do to address academic integrity is rather a remedial or, uh, you know, to, what we do is to alleviate the situation when someone comes to us. But perhaps what we can also do, and hopefully this is what this initiative uh, could be about, is to try to think of some preventive measures that will stop the academic misconduct uh, from happening in the first place. So maybe one of the suggestions that we could do uh, uh, and focus on is that because when students come here, especially with new incoming international students, there's a lot for them to digest. You know, there's a lot of uh, information that they still don't know. Maybe they don't know uh, to, to go and check the academic integrity website or the hub. But uh, from the first week, what happens is that they are signed up for our uh, GSS newsletter, which is sent to them weekly. So maybe we can, uh, th th this is a suggestion that I will also bring up uh, to, to people at GSS, that we can just publish uh, informative uh, news about the academic integrity and what it means and the resources that's available to the students uh, so that we can help this in a preventive way. Um, maybe another suggestion is, so, you know, when you think about uh, academic uh, misconduct or integrity, uh, graduate students and the fact that they have taken so many courses before, uh, the experience that they've had uh, could be a valuable asset. So uh, in, in conducting some of the uh, courses or when it comes to, let's say, submitting assignments, but maybe we could get help from the experience of the TAs, maybe the students uh, who are coming from a different background, they can just uh, go to them, they can uh, submit assignments just for a checkup, quick checkup to see if, if there is issue with uh, academic misconduct. But so these are some of the suggestions that hopefully this initiative uh, could be about and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much to, to all of the panelists for, for these position statements from your various roles across campus and relating to the topic of academic integrity. So what we'd like to do now is to open up to any audience questions. Uh, you can ask questions by raising your hand uh, or by typing them in the chat and we can read them out. So I'll, I'll give a moment to see if there are any questions from the audience to any of the panelists. Yes, I see one hand from uh, Sean. Um, I, I just, Sorry, can I, can, yeah, I guess I'm speaking. I just want to quickly say thank you so much for this session. It is as a new teacher who just taught the first class and who spent half of the semester being anxious about the potential cases of academic misconduct. Um, I found this session extremely helpful. Uh, and one of the, as I was listening to all your um, words of wisdom, um, there were many moments of enlightenment. And one of them was from Professor Burke. That was when she said, um, because I was exactly the person who, after I identifying some, um, potent, well, I was pretty sure it was academic misconduct. I had a feeling, how can you treat me like this? And am I, do you think I'm an idiot? That's really the first thought that I had. Well, I'm glad I didn't really um, let that lead my judgment and uh, how I dealt with that. But after hearing that from Professor Brooke, I know, okay, so I, because after, ref, uh, upon reflection, I felt I was, that was problematic. Uh, but now I know I, I was not alone. Um, so this, this, I guess this is, um, so I guess an important lesson I learned from this is to how to treat um, students as human beings. Uh, that's a key lesson. And in, in the process of learning this lesson, I also realized to understand us, uh, teachers as human beings who make mistakes, who have our um, blind spots. 
that's um, another way of looking at this start. Thank you so much. I will stop here. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for that perspective. Stefania, did you want to respond to that or anyone else on the panel? I, I will just say that, you know, that came from my own experience as a new instructor as well, right? Um, so uh, I think I'm glad it helped. And I, I, I think it's also important that we remember that the wellness and all of the burdens and is applies equally to all of us who are instructors and TAs and administrators. Um, so a little generosity and uh, um, not assuming the worst, uh, I think would go a long way in many of the parts of our, of our work life. Absolutely. Um, I might just take a moment to just remind of the importance of that first contact with a student and from sort of a health and all policies approach. Jared has put in the chat, we have a template email that is available on the website. Uh, there's also a template available through the Ombudsperson's Toolkit for Academic Misconduct on examples of ways to communicate that first initial moment with the student and how potentially triggering that can be. So just something to, to think about and we've got some resources to, to connect to that. Um, I'll take another hand and then we'll, we'll see if there's anything in the chat. So uh, Paul C. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I've, uh, I think my, there we go, my video is working again. Um, so again, I would like to start by thanking everybody on the panel today for uh, providing insight into this. I do think that an educative approach is very, very important. I, uh, I spent 10 years on the President's Advisory Committee for Student Discipline myself, so this is something that I've been involved in. Um, one thing that occurs to me sometimes, I, 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 it occurs to me that students tend to listen to each other more than they listen to us. And I'm wondering if any work has been done in terms of maybe having student ambassadors who could perhaps work with us to educate students. I think uh, social media now seems to be something that students turn to when they run into problems. I think that their first inclination is to turn to each other before they turn to us. So I guess one question is, is has any work being done in that area? Is that, is that a viable avenue for us to consider? Uh, and my other question is I very recently recently ran into my first case of contract cheating, which I have to say was extremely jarring. Um, I think from um, a fairness perspective, where we have students who have, uh, I would say, a considerable amount of wealth, given the amount of money that was involved, uh, to have other people do their work, is the university lobbying for, and, and in some countries, for example, uh, these companies that offer contract cheating, uh, it's illegal. And I'm wondering, um, can anyone speak to whether or not that has actually been effective in those countries? Uh, is this something that UBC is considering in terms of lobbying our, our own government, in terms of taking uh, action against these companies that frankly are just preying on some of our students? Thank you, Paul. Um, I wonder, I have a few thoughts on the first part of the question. I wonder, Dana, if Dana or Sahan, you want to sort of respond around what are some of the, the roles that we could look towards having? And I know we've had conversations, but maybe I'll open the floor to you to begin. Yeah, I'm happy to start us off. Um, and so I think Ainsley mentioned that's at the beginning of the discussion, but we had a um, academic integrity week um, earlier this year that the AMS participated in. And I think that was really great to collaborate with the university um, to meet students where they're at. And so what we did was that we distributed kind of information cards on, you know, what's happening at UBC right now with academic integrity, um, what's the AI hub. Um, and we also gave away free cookies and just kind of engaged students in the nest um, in a very approachable way. Um, and we also had um, kind of a poster with the question of uh, what does academic integrity mean to you? Um, and students could kind of put little post-it notes um, of um, what it meant personally to them so they can make that personal connection. Um, and so that's been really great. And we've also been engaging with um, all of the faculty undergraduate societies as well. And they all have um, student executives um, and uh, VP academics who do this work. And we've um, distributed materials to them and really made sure that they feel um, like they're part of this as well. And I think it's um, so important to continue doing that work. Um, but yeah, happy to hear Sahan's thoughts if he has anything as well. Sure, yes, I, I also like to mention that I guess we have, we do have some student ambassadors and uh, people who are uh, 
actively pursuing this and uh, I guess one of the uh, suggestions that one of the uh, remarks that Paul made is in line with what I was also suggesting having uh, students graduate students uh, to to take role and to be a part of this because uh, you know students tend to be more uh, let's say receptive and open and comfortable with other students uh, other than a faculty member so uh, hopefully this is something that the you know panel and you know this initiative can consider and we can focus on absolutely um and i'll just close on that remark and then i'm going to pass it over to to Lori about the possibility to explore a student ambassador student mentor uh it's part of the plan so i'm really happy to see that that need sort of expressed uh, and what I think is really positive is that now that we do have staff people who can work on this full time, when we have these ideas, we can put them into action. So one of the things that we've started doing with uh, the AMS, who have been phenomenal collaborators on, on this topic uh, this year, is we have a Take 5 for Integrity campaign where we've prepared a video, slides and notes which either um, faculty can invite people from the hub into their course or faculty can deliver this themselves. But we're, we're looking towards actually delivering these as paired presentations with one staff member and one student. And that for us is sort of a bit of preliminary work towards what would the role of a student ambassador or a student educator or a student mentor be? So absolutely, it's very much in the plans and we're, we're excited to, to work towards that. I will pass it over to Lori, uh, Paul, to answer the second part of your question around contract cheating and what the university is, can, or should do. Yeah, thanks, uh, Ainsley, and also thanks, Paul, for the two questions. Um, as a brief comment on the first part of the question, the research is very clear about um, that student peer-to-peer -peer attitudes about misconduct can be the most important element in creating a culture of integrity in your course. So. We can think about not only institutional structures that we should design around student ambassadors, et cetera, but also in, um, again, thinking about how to create the conditions to get the most student buy-in in in your course so that they aren't like, yeah, the prof said this, but we're all meeting at uh, after class to to write the assignment together. But having having a, an expectation amongst each other will, will be influential. Um, in terms of contract cheating, uh, you asked about um, so, uh, governmental responses or, or legal responses. Uh, Europe has, uh, and actually it's Ireland specifically, has instituted um, an actual law. The government has, an, um, has implemented a law uh, making contract cheating companies actions illegal um, as one approach. Australia has also done this, and they, Australia and Europe are leaders in this, um, in this front. Of course, we know that contract cheating companies are kind of rhizomatic in that, um, you know, you lop off the head in, in Ireland, but then they set up shop elsewhere, but at least it makes a really strong statement. In Canada, we are beginning those efforts. I'm part of a, a national committee um, on contract cheating that's being led by um, Sarah Eaton at the University of Calgary. And one part of the, that committee has just begun this year, but one aim is to do the lobbying of the government, the federal government, um, as well as um, at the institutional level to enact those um, those legalistic frameworks, as well as continuing that kind of educative and activist role that we think uh, institutions need to um, need to adopt. So uh, it continues. We do have some precedents, um, but it's always it's always a challenge. That's great to hear. Thanks so much. Thanks, Lori. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take Adelaide's question from the live questions, and then we're going to take Katya's question in the chat. I'd like to respond quickly to one of the questions I saw in the chat from um, Jeanette about whether the the, syll the syllabus statement, the academic integrity statement language was going to be updated, just with a quick response to say that the Academic Integrity Advisory Committee, which is another new group that's working on this topic this year, is working on an academic integrity statement that will reflect this new orientation and this sort of shift in the conversation. So that will be coming up. So thank you for raising that. So I'll pass it over to Adelaide. Yeah, uh, quite quickly, uh, I'm a German language uh, instructor. 
And as a non-tenured faculty member, we are not in a position of power and we are always scrutinized by our students. That's besides the point. Then students seem also to differentiate between the required courses and also the electives. And then they're saying, oh, well, it's an elective and, you know, I can juggle and get extra help to boost my general uh, average. So, I mean, as an instructor, I understand that also very well. But uh, there's also a danger for students. Uh, they put themselves in a very vulnerable situation that they get blackmailed. And once when they have used these services, they may encroach on them and uh, force students to, to maintain that relationship. And they are being then almost melt uh, to use their services, even if they want to get out and get away from that. And in that sense, students also need some support and help. And I personally, yeah, don't know what, what kind of means there are. So that's it. But instructors, non-tenured, are not talking from a power of, uh, from a position of power. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you to the panel. Thank you. Uh, would anyone on the panel like to respond? Stefania. Um, well, I want to thank uh, her for those comments. I think this is where the accountability of the unit is really important, that there needs to be support within the academic units. Uh, most departments will have a designate who handles misconduct uh, in the unit. And so I think really having a process that is supportive um, and that provides support to instructors, whether that's someone that's sitting in the meeting, uh, using the resources that are available, and not um, leaving new uh, and untenured faculty to navigate this process alone. I think just the same way we don't want students um, to navigate the process alone, I think is, is key. So I find that I'm often going into departments to help them as their own little community figure out how to, to um, change the conversation in their discipline and in their department. Thank you. Um, Jared, um, or Katya, would you like to read out your question or would you like it to be read out? I can, I can read it. Um, so I was asking about, let me just scroll to it. There we go. Um, first of all, thank you so much. Um, this was really um, a pleasure to hear all these perspectives from different angles. Um, often in these conversations, I hear sort of the need for a shared understanding of academic integrity and I get a little skeptical when I hear it because I also am thinking immediately about how um, we have different approaches in different fields and we use materials differently, we collaborate differently, um, uh, we have different ethical practices or they focus on different things. And so I'm wondering about plans at UBC to have more of these conversations across fields to create awareness, tease out differences, um, uh, understand each other better across research fields and in our teaching. Would anybody like to take that one? James? Yeah, this is this is something that I've been thinking of. Uh, so thanks, Katja. I, I, you know, it, it's, it varies even within a department, right? I think about uh, computer science and the the various numbers, like you go out into the, go out into the world and there are uh, you know, there are companies you can work for that are making open source code. And there's a certain set of requirements for like, well, how do you attribute that open source code? And then there's other companies who have do not disclose agreements. And there's a whole different standard. And so I think just even in disciplines, there are differences. And I actually had a perf I had an instructor come up to me and they, they asked, like, is this, they pointed out something and it's like, is this misconduct? And I was like, well, what did you, how did you frame the misconduct in your class? And I think it's really important that those differences that you talk about, I think are the shared understanding is that it, there's a responsibility for instructors to understand what misconduct is in their class and, and, and in their specific assignment, because even, you know, specific assignments have, you know, you can't share any of this, right? I want this to be absolutely on your own, or you could do it in pairs and what that kind of work is going to look like. So there's a lot of work for instructors to understand that and explicitly say that and to not assume that what they are setting as the standards for misconduct or integrity, I should say, are 
the same across. And so I think I think it's a very valuable conversation to have is that there's ecologies here and there are different ecologies and we have to really understand all of them. I might just quickly add, I think that that's one of the things the hub can do and things like AI week. Um, so while absolutely the nuts and bolts differ uh, greatly and that has a lot also to do with um, disciplines and but uh, back to Shirley, when we talk about our strategic plans, <laughs> uh, you know, there are the, you know, everyone uses the word ethical. So while the details of what ethical practice looks like in different computer science courses or in a, a course, um, that is the where we come together as a community, I think. And it is about us um, reflecting on what that means and knowing that the differences are there and then that that's where accountability you know, so the two different computer science professors, it's their per, it's their job to say in my course, this is the kind of research and dissemination and skills that we're learning. It's about collaborative research. In this other one, it's this kind. So um, again, I see the hub and these kinds of events as one way to have these conversations. So I also hope that we'll be able to continue in a variety of ways. So I'll take a, a comment from Dana and, and Brenda, and then we're going to wrap up because we've reached the, the hour. So Dana. I'll make this super quick. I just want to say that you can share the definition with your students as well. And so I think having those discussions where you can ask students, like, what does academic integrity mean to you? What does this mean to you in this discipline? What have you kind of learned so far? I think having those discussions is so important. Even just taking that, and again, like that five minutes to do that helps students have buy-in to what your definition of it is and um, and then make them feel empowered that they can also participate um, in these conversations and that you're willing to listen as well. Thanks, Dana. Uh, Brenda, closing question or thoughts? Hi there. Actually, it's a comment, if that's okay, not a question. Um, my name's Brenda. I actually was in Sahan's position about 10 years ago at the GSS. I had the pleasure of working with Shirley and uh, dealing with some of these issues. And at that time, um, I'm an anthropologist. My one thing that really struck me was the way that the procedures that were in place at that time were particularly hitting international students because the consequences were so much more severe and also the background that they were coming with was not necessarily what was taken for granted at UBC as they were coming in. And as we're talking about shared definitions, I think it's really important to understand that the, our, our understanding of academic integrity comes from a very specific cultural and intellectual history that is not necessarily shared all over the world. I'll never forget one student who said to me, you know, in India, where he was from, the, the individual ownership of the written word is not a thing. And I think it's really important to, to understand that, and, you know, I'm out of date with what's happening at UBC, so it sounds like we're moving towards this more, but it's not necessarily just a matter of telling people do this don't don't commit academic misconduct or you know do academic integrity when that doesn't necessarily connect with the norms and the values and the pictures that people have of how the world operates that's that's my first point point. and then the second thing that i just wanted to get in there was that i've actually spent the last semester working at uh, an international college where it's 100% international students and plagiarism is rampant. And I've been talking to my students about what they're expected to do, where they come from. And writing a term paper, for many of them, they have never done it before. And they're just giving me a string of cut and pasted stuff from various sources because they don't know what else to do. And you know, I've tried to give them some information about how you actually write a term paper, which is something that I've been doing since I was probably eight. I mean, not a term paper, but I remember my first little baby research project at the library when I was in grade three. And it, they're, they're supposed to be getting this from their uh, English classes, but it's, it's not something that I can just kind of stick in there in an hour or two, like, oh, here's how you write a, temp, uh, a term paper. So I don't know how relevant that is to what is happening at UBC these days, but I just had to get that in there. So thank you. 
Thank you. Before we close, um, were there any, did anybody on the panel want to respond briefly to, to those comments? Okay. Well, we've reached the end of our hour. Um, as Stefania mentioned, feeling very happy. I, I also feel very happy at the panel that we've been able to bring together, the audience who've given their time today and participated so actively. It's been a wonderful discussion and I wanna thank you all. We will follow up with um, a number of links that we shared today around some of the discussion that we've had. So you can expect to receive that. Um, and the recording will be available on our website and you will also receive a direct copy of it so thank you very much, everybody, for attending and have a wonderful day.